What do you notice when you look at this picture? How people respond really depends on how much expertise they have. A novice teacher might look at this and, and notice, ah, oh, students are looking up, students are working, the teacher is standing at the back. Um, things which really anyone could notice. Whereas people with more expertise in teaching be able to look at it and make some snap judgments. They might think, for example, that it's the middle of the lesson because students are mostly engaged in a task. Um, they might notice that the teacher has seems to have split the class into two uh, and perhaps think that they've chosen to do that uh, because of different needs that students have, different things they've understood. Um, teachers might even notice that there are uh, two whiteboards. There appears to be a whiteboard at the back of the room, which is fairly unusual. Not only do experts um, see differently to novices, they actually look differently. This image is a still from a, a video study where they tracked eye movements. So they looked at where experts and novices were looking uh, within a, a video of a classroom. What they noticed was that uh, novices kind of looked all around the room at anything that looked interesting. And where novices looked disproportionately more than experts is shown with orange squares. So um, novices tend to look at, um, one of the kids had shiny shoelaces, and so novices would, would look at that. Or they just look at the back of the room, where, as you can see, there's, there's nothing going on. Um, experts are looking at things like body movement, sort of where is a student looking? What are they going to be doing next? So experts go into the room using their existing knowledge to look for different things which help them to interpret what's happening differently. And so this speaks to, to a fundamental idea in expertise research, um, that experts and novices see and therefore think and therefore act differently. So an expert will look for different things, notice different things, interpret them differently, and then be able to respond. So you've looked at the image, you've seen where a student is likely perhaps to, to be losing concentration, you act accordingly. A novice is looking around and they're so busy looking at the shoelaces or whatever it is uh, that they miss those cues. How do we break things down from novice to expert? So I'm gonna use David Berliner's model because I don't think there's a better model out there. Um, and he posits five stages that people move through. First, novices. So Berliner describes novices as being people who are taught and try to apply context-free rules. So um, never criticise a student, don't smile until Christmas. Uh, and they apply these rules without really any sense of when a good time to apply them is uh, or what the effects, what the different effects might be on different students. Next, advanced beginner. Um, as an advanced beginner, your start experience is starting to affect your understanding of those rules. So, for example, you're realising that occasionally it might be a good idea to criticise a student if that is justified and you do it in the right way. Or um, that praise sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, but the, the thing about advanced beginners is experience is starting to modify their understanding, but they still don't necessarily know what's important. Stage three is competency. Um, and as a competent performer, you're getting to the point where um, you, you've got a sense of what's important. You're getting a chance to prioritise. You can make a plan that's got a pretty good chance of working. Um, and in consequence, you also feel a lot more responsible for what's going on. You realise that it's your teaching that's going to make a difference to what students do or don't understand. Fourthly, there's proficiency. And proficiency is the point at which um, you start to, to act a little bit intuitively. You really get a sense for being able to read the room. So you, you, you just sort of know that it's a good idea to wander over to the far side of the room because things aren't quite as, as um, focused over there as maybe you feel they should be. Um, or you have a sense that your plan might need modification as you're going through it, even though you're not, you're not quite sure why, um, but you just start to think it's, it's not gonna fly with that class today. And experts, Belinda describes as, as almost being irrational. Um, so they, they act so fluidly, they, most of the time they're almost on autopilot because um, everything just sort of flows, everything's under control. And then occasionally they'll do something that's, that's completely unexpected. Um, and so Belinda describes uh, being with a teacher who um, changes the way she teaches one day. And Belinda's sort of saying, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And she's like, oh, no. Didn't even, didn't even notice, don't know why. And eventually she clicks and she realised, well, it was raining. Uh, and Belinda sort of tries to get her to explain this. And, and essentially her answer is, 
because it was raining, she knew that students would respond to the lesson in a slightly different way, so she knew she was going to have to order and sequence activities slightly differently. But she wasn't even conscious of it until she was sort of forced to explain that. The Berliner's model is really nice, but from this point I'm just going to talk about experts, novices and intermediates, just because it's a little bit, a little bit simpler. Um, and I think a, a point that's worth making is um, there is no such thing as an expert teacher. Um, we know, for example, that teachers, keep if they keep teaching the same year group or the same subject, the same courses, they get better faster um, than if they teach different courses. Um, so I, you know, I'm a history teacher, um, fairly competent as a history teacher. If you put me in a maths classroom, my expertise in classroom management and relationship building, such as it is, will help. But my expertise in explaining historical facts is not going to help so much. Um, and so we are expert in many different things at many times. So you might have teachers who uh, are fantastic at working with pupils because they're previous experience, but are not that good at the instructional components of teaching. How do we help teachers get better then? So if you've got a novice, um, what are they trying to do? They're trying to soak things up, just, just pick up, you know, what works? What are the rules around here? Um, and ideally, you just want to expose them to as much uh, as many examples of teaching as you can, particularly as many good models of teaching as you can. Um, they're going to need to get a lot of practice. And ideally, you want to um, free up their working memory so they can concentrate on one thing at a time. So the more routines that we can give a, a novice, so for example, um, always get students to come into the lesson like this, uh, and that way you don't have to think about it. So you can concentrate on looking at students' faces and working out who, you know, who might be not having a very good day, who needs an extra boost today, or you can concentrate on how you're introducing uh, today's idea rather than what students should be doing as they come in and sit down. And the last thing we might want to do for novices uh, is make sure that we're focused on explaining why we're doing what we're doing. As for experts, to be honest, a lot of the learning is self-generated, just sort of like put them in new situations, put them in new scenarios, give them the chance to uh, talk about it, reflect on it, particularly sort of recording what they do so they can come back to it. Um, but the other thing I think I'd say is most people, by the time they've put in the, the decade, which maybe it roughly is, uh, are, are probably in, if they've focused on teaching, they might be in a teacher educator role already. There probably aren't that many expert teachers who we're working with on a day to day basis, focusing on trying to improve their own teaching. So what about people who are at an intermediate stage? Um, they, they know the basics, we want to keep challenging them to get better. Essentially here it's about structuring their knowledge and helping them to put it to use. Um, so they already know quite a lot of stuff. Can we help them to see that teaching um, this topic is quite similar to teaching this topic, but different in this other way? Um, can we help them to see the, the limits of the techniques they're currently using? For this discussion of cases seems to be really, really helpful, um, offering them multiple representations, so lots of different examples, um, and really getting them to think through how do these concepts work in practice. Instructional coaching seems like a particularly productive way to approach this, um, because it means you can tailor your support for whoever you're working with. So even with an expert, you can be nudging them and saying, um, what else do you think about what happened halfway through the lesson? And at that point, uh, an expert may well run for it themselves, run with it themselves, Whereas if you're working with a novice, you may start from sort of square one and say, um, uh, what happened here? Why did it happen? Here's another example. Time for you to practice. So instructional coaching is a really exciting way of approaching this.